Hello and welcome back to episode 004 part 2 of Poor Man's Electronics Bench. I am attempting to clean off the corrosion from my battery terminals that I removed from the printed circuit board in part 1 and I've gone over a couple of ways of doing it. I ended up settling on using a mixture of vinegar and table salt that seemed to be one of the least chemically aggressive ways of doing it from what I've seen on other online posts, uh, YouTube videos and information in general. Somebody else had another method using some liquid toilet bowl cleaner which was quite a bit more caustic but it was also a lot quicker. I decided on using the vinegar solution, the vinegar and salt solution solution because it just didn't seem as chemically aggressive and I wasn't really wanting to get into dealing with a harsher acid in doing this. Part of what I'm doing also is going to be I found that I'm, I'm needing to take some physical abrasion to the surfaces in order to clean off some of the corrosion and at least the good part about it is you don't have to worry about handling salt water and vinegar solution. So I can pull this out of here and when I first did it I found that it didn't quite I soaked it and agitated it for about an hour and it didn't quite remove all of the corrosion to my liking. I could still see some dark spots on it so what I've been doing is taking it out of the solution and it has some 4 aught fine, um, fine steel wool I'm using and it ends up doing a fairly good job of abrading the rest of the corrosion off. Now granted I did let this sit overnight in the solution. I did clean and abrade it yesterday and it seems to and then for you know, about an hour or so I let it soak scrubbed it down really well, scraped, scrubbed it's it's really it's just unfortunate that you have to go through all this just to restore things from a battery manufacturer that really couldn't do a better job of making something that doesn't damage the products that you're they're putting their <laughs> putting their products in uh, this is a darn shame in general I found that some of these uh, cleaned up really well I mean I don't see any out, outside of well there, there were some dark spots around the solder terminal areas but other than that Things clean up fairly well with the 4 out steel wool. I suppose you could use some scotch braid as well. I think the steel wool adds a little bit more of a polish to it than the scotch braid. I've tried both. It seems to do a fairly good job. Either one seems to do a, do a better than nothing job, that's for sure, but I don't know if you can see there is a little bit of corrosion on the bottom terminal maybe to do with the flux or the solder that's on it out of these four I guess they got some dark spots on the bottom it's something to do with this with the solder and our flux but it seems to clean up once I clean and polish up once I take the steel wool to it And my main delay in this video was waiting for a bottle of liquid tinning solution to come in that I ordered to try to replate something on here to prevent this copper from oxidizing and sulfating. Pardon my computer here, it wants to reboot for some reason. I'm still not figuring it out. I'm going to have to take the processor and the memory out and reseed everything I think it's, it's got an odd thing going on with it or just reboots at random something to do with Chrome and Windows 10 maybe too because it seems like if I don't run Chrome Windows 10 works fine 
But I'll get into that later. And this one piece here really didn't get corroded from the batteries, think, thankfully. Seems to have a good good nickel plating on it still. The only thing I have is some solder. It's on the connection terminal, so we'll clean that up. But all in all, I'm happy with the amount of cleaning that the vinegar and salt did. It took, like I said, I gave it a while. I gave it overnight. I'm trying not to be in too big a hurry. And uh, we're going to proceed on with the process. Give him a little Duncan some some water and swish them around for a bit before we move on to the thinning solution. That should be enough. last step will I'm going to put some gloves on and dry these and then clean them off with some 99% alcohol just to try to decrease them and get them chemically prepped as well as I can. I have to clean out one of my little containers so I'll be back to continue the cleaning process. And I am back with two clean containers. One will be for the alcohol and the other one will be for the tinning solution. I'm not worried about the alcohol on my skin as much as the tinning solution but also my fingers have some oils on them. I can try to avoid to put on the metal and some handling things. We've got some 99% alcohol I've had for a while that I'll end up using up soon probably doing all this electronic work, but it's served me well so far. And I would just like to dry those surfaces off a bit more before I delve deeper into cleaning. This plating is electroplating, I know it's pretty demanding. It definitely doesn't want any type of contamination on the surface or else you'll get bad results. <coughs> Chemical plating probably is not too happy if you had oily contaminants on surfaces as well, I'd imagine. I'm give them a good stir. Looking for a clean paper towel on my roll.
This part isn't the most exciting, so I'll probably speed the video up for a little bit while I clean all these off and prep them. I'm not sure if I'm even going to dunk this one. It is pretty well totally uncontaminated. It just has one small spot of exposed copper I've seen. A couple of small spots on the back side. I don't think it's worth I don't think it's worth a dunk. Personally, it's in really nice shape. I'll set him aside. on my alcohol and now for the next step it's probably more than one supplier on this and I also read that you can get a homemade brew using some pieces of lead free plumbing solder which is basically almost all tin a certain acid, I forgot which one it was, and you actually mix some some thiourea, which is uh, one of the main ingredients in Tarnix. In with it, and depending on how things come out, you either have to heat, heat and stir the solution, or it might be cloudy in suspension, but this is an interesting little process because it it starts right away I'm probably going to agitate this for a while won't be too exciting it has a little bit of a smell to it and the instructions say seven to ten minutes stirring occasionally I guess so that'll I'll be I'll be doing that while being on camera but I will probably speed the process up in the video as well but it looks to be doing doing a good job because taking one of these pieces out I do not see any more exposed copper or brass. It seems to be filling in some voids that were pitted from the corrosion. But it's going to be a process that takes a little bit, so. I'll speed things up while I'm doing this and come back to it at normal speed when I get about 10 minutes of stirring and exposure time in the solution.
Okay, I've been agitating and stirring and just soaking the parts for about 10 minutes. And it looks like they have the plating solution has done its task. There's no exposed copper or brass. I'd imagine this is some sort of an alloy. It's probably stiffer than regular copper. On the pieces and the parts that aren't nickel plated seem to have a good coating of tin on them. Seems to have gotten into the pitting fairly well. The matte looking non-reflective surfaces are the parts that have been coated with the, the liquid tinning solution. And my main concern was just over time that they wouldn't have any corrosion from that bare copper or brass being exposed to oxygen and sulfur in the atmosphere. And it seems to have done its job. Granted, like I said, this is not a high dollar piece of electronics equipment, but it's something that you'd still like to see working and functional. I'm going to reclaim my tinning solution because it really doesn't get contaminated. It just loses some of its available tin in the solution, but I am also going to get a small tub of water to rinse these out with, so I will be back again. Okay, and the tub of water has appeared on my workstation. I'm going to give the parts a little dunk. We don't need our clock anymore. <clears throat> I did go through the process of checking some of the electronics on the board already. I've checked the capacitors and they seem to be acting like capacitors which is a good thing. Luckily this alkali leak issue did not infiltrate onto the electronics on the board. That, that just makes a serious situation for repair almost every time. But it's really Okay, so it's just such a shame. Okay, so these four guys are cleaned off. I'm going to place them off to the side. This one is also one that I didn't put in the tinning solution should also be ready to go. Like I said, I'm happy with the results. It should give it some more longevity, use with the proper batteries, maybe some anti-corrosive grease placed on those terminals as well. So now let's get back to putting these back into the unit. This time I ended up taping off some of the printed circuit board area so I don't come into conflict with it during reassembly. There is a tuned coil on this I'm trying to avoid breaking the wires on. finding myself needing to prop things up 
going to put some flux onto the soldered areas of the battery terminals to aid in the reassembly process. I purchased some sticky old resin flux that will probably last me for a while. It works, works very well, but it does leave a lot of residue, I found. Some of these might need a little bit of persuasion with heat in order to get them to seat back into position. Before we finish doing the final soldering. seems to have seated. Might as well carry on and apply solder to the rest of that connection. not doing the best job of cooperation. I hope to do better on my next attempt. I would say that's not a great solder joint. I was able to move the whole clip. I'm going to try this again. It seems like I have an adequate amount of heat. I probably have to apply it more to the actual battery terminal than the copper pads. Video crashed. I'm back. <clears throat> Just finishing up soldering the pins back onto the board here. Trying to use a little more flux in the process. <clears throat> I 
As well as I tried to clean these off with breed, it just seems like I've got some solder restrictions in these joints. Oh boy. There we go. It looks like I finally got them fully seated. I think this one's not soldered well. I'm going to have to revisit him. Oh boy. Okay. Mm -mm. For some reason that one had a hard time poking through the board. There we go. Felt it physically seat better. Now I just have to get it They have a good joint. can't say I'm 100% happy with it. I might go through the process of removing that one and cleaning him up a little better. Uh, for some reason the solder does not want to stick to that clip. I can't say why. Well I can. It's probably from poor cleaning on my part. <laughs> <It's not laughs> this isn't This isn't black magic by any means, it's basically success is done by proper technique. Okay. I think to try my best to clean this with some physical abrasion. I can't see why it was having such a difficulty. And staying clean, but I probably left some sort of residue of something on here.
it's really uh, probably just got such a good nickel coating on it in one part I wasn't prepped well from the factory that I can imagine that it just doesn't want to tin very well This thing is drowned in flux and it does, just doesn't want to behave itself. I can get flux to stick to it, I can't get can't get solder to stick to it apparently. Well, I'm going to try to turn the camera off and try to get through that nickel and get a get a better solder tinning on there. It is just being difficult. We shall be back. Okay, after working on things a little bit, it seems like I finally got a good coat of solder on the ends of those terminals. Oh man, I think I double checked my work. It's not totally out of alignment. It fell out. <laughs> Just having a heck of a day with this. Ah. It's always fun when one simple part of a project goes or goes sideways on you. My downfall was using that spacer to stabilize the board. It's better than what it was. That I can guarantee. Clean up some of my rosin mess on here before I... Take the tape off and clean off whatever is left. Isopropyl alcohol does clean rosin eventually, but it takes a while. I've probably have to get a small bottle of mineral spirits or acetone into the mix soon. Kind of expedite things. Right now, I'm trying to keep the flammability factor of the workstation down to a minimum. Uh, 
No, it doesn't look like there's much more rosin that's escaped anywhere. It's going to go affect things and it's looking like the battery terminals are aligned well enough or they they will seat back within the enclosure, so it's time to start putting things back together. It's always fun after you walk away from something for a few days and say, you know, how did that go back together again? And It's nice to have the video, but I think I'm just going to fake my way through it in this case. Probably remember things well enough. I know that I have my series of buttons that match up with the faceplate. And I also should clean off my zebra strip connections a little better. Just to make sure. Try to use something that sheds a little less lint. That one's a regular Q tip, you can feel it snagging in the traces. My four battery terminals have to slide into slots and seat. It's like my wires going to my antenna coil are intact. Okay, that part done. Four small Phillips screws that hold the board down to the LCD assembly. Or the, the I mean hold the board down to the back panel. Wait a second, I'm doing this backwards. I have to I have to screw this board down to the LCD assembly first. That's right, this gets a little complicated. I have to go get that. It's in another, another area, so I shall be back. Taking things apart is usually no, seems sometimes, most times to be nowhere near as complicated as putting them back together. I remembered, <laughs> I finally remembered that the LCD assemblies have the two zebra strips. They have four mounting holes that these that this board mounts onto, and you also have to make a good contact with. So these actually have to be this assembly has to be screwed onto this board first. I need to take this and put this off to the side a little bit. I will be mounting this board onto this one, wiring permitting. And it's <laughs> orienting things to get the wire to permit it is not exactly the easiest thing. There's only a certain amount of slack in this, but it looks like that's what I need. The 
these screws have to be installed and fastened fairly well onto the LCD panel for those zebra strips to make contact between the board and the LCDs themselves. Oh, it's magnetic, but not magnetic enough to lift up the screw. There's a little trimmer capacitor on there. I'm not going to disturb it. I'm not sure, or it could be a trim pot for the LCD display. I've seen some clocks that actually have LCD display adjustments from the factory. We'll leave that one alone. This clock was functioning when I first when it was put out of commission, except for the battery issues. So, so now we have to go back to slating the battery terminals in. has to stay backside down like this due to the plastic buttons. Oh. Okay. Got the terminals in on one side. This side I do not. It's going to take a little a little prodding with a screwdriver. I suppose this is no worse than putting together Always a neat assembly at Christmas, but okay. Looks like all our battery contacts are in the proper spots. I didn't do the world's best cleaning job inside this battery compartment. There's definitely some alkali mopping up to do in here. I thought I did a little better, but I guess not. did manage to have some sort of insulating grease left over from installation of something. It's probably just a regular silicone generic battery terminal grease. I'm going to apply some of that to the battery connection areas. And this clock should start functioning without installing all the rest of the screws, so that's what I'm going to give it a try. Now I have an outdoor sensor that I have fresh batteries in. That has been connected and stabilized outside for a while. I am going to get some lithium double A batteries which I had around here somewhere here they are. 
the lithium batteries seem to not leak when they discharge. I haven't recalled one set of lithium batteries discharging and then leaking in anything. So This clock has some interesting requirements for setup. We are going to go through that in a minute. Hey, we got a beep out of it. There's a few things that go on with this. It doesn't seem like it's happy unless... Clean this up a little better. It's receiving information from the outdoor temperature sensor. So we're going to give it a minute and see if it does that first. It seems like once it does that, that then it's happy going through the rest of its paces. Give it a little more cleaning on the face while that sensor transmits about once a minute or so. And there we go. We've got it 42 degrees at the sensor. I'm going to do an experiment with this clock. I am going to give it a very rudimentary setup and then let it source its time from WWVB overnight. There are some set buttons on the back I'm going to go through. It's asking me for my time zone, so right now it says EST. I'm going to go to Central. Because I'm near Chicago. Daylight savings time on. I'm not sure what the U5 means. I am not going to set the date or the time on this. Right now it's sourced at 11.01 p.m. The 00D, that's the moon phase. It will set and give an indication. Unfortunately, it's backwards from... It'll darken the portion of the moon that, that is lit on the phase, so I'm going to leave that alone. It's going through the date, 1231, Sunday, 12-hour 12 format, degrees Fahrenheit, and 1102, and then I have an indoor temperature of 69 degrees. So what I'm going to do is finish putting the screws in the back of this. I'm going to put it in a place... On a window sill in the west side of my house that will aid it to pick up WWV B, which is a 60 kilohertz long wave. It's actually a sub long wave signal. It's kind of a, kind of a weird signal, but it's been around for years. It's actually used by many devices, and through a series of amplitude pulse tones without any vocal input on the broadcast that ends up sending out the information to set an accurate time, day, date, moon phase, and daylight central time status for a device to come uh, to pick up the signal decode and set itself. So we're going to finish assembly on this Put it in place and then it probably won't pick the signal up during the day. It's, it seems like the long wave portion, the long wave band is received better at night. And actually, this clock has one weird quirk where it doesn't start looking for that signal until the time goes to 12 or 1 a.m. or 12 o'clock or 12 or 1 a.m. You'll see a little kind of like a roundish antenna symbol like that appear on the clock when it's sourcing sourcing the receiver to try to get the signal it'll pulse on and off for 10 minutes if it doesn't successfully receive a signal in that hour it will try it again at 1 a.m. I watched it a couple nights it'll try it again at 1 a.m. and I think at 2 a.m. and then after that I don't know if it keeps going or not but I wasn't going to stay up to watch it anymore <laughs> so we're going to, going to put it in place and see how it behaves.
and come back to that for the end of the episode. I've set the clock up in a west-facing window, and I don't know if you can you'll probably see, but the settings have all set themselves. I have a 57 degree indoor temperature. Date is correct. Day is correct. The moon phase is correct. The indicator for the reception is correct. And right now I am tuned to WWV at 15 megahertz. And my trusty old realistic. And the results are forthcoming. So the clock seems to be functional in a good state of repair and hopefully shouldn't have any more battery issues and going forward should provide years of accurate timekeeping. Not only that, but it's nice to have the temperature display for the outdoor temperature. So that concludes this episode 004 of the Skyscan Atomic Clock Repair. And I hope you enjoyed the content and tune in for more content in the near future. Thank you. This content is available on YouTube and Odyssey.com. If you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe. Hope you return soon.